Good evening, and welcome to day six of the 2021 Milwaukee Film Festival, presented by Associated Bank. I'm Tiana Clayton Mallet, Community Outreach Coordinator with Black Lens at Milwaukee Film, and this is Black Women and Art Through Liberation. This is a conversation with Black women discussing the film, how it feels to be free, and their personal experiences navigating the entertainment industry as Black women. Before we get started with the conversation, a few pieces of housekeeping. As you've seen, we have a double up challenge happening. Thanks to the generosity of Susan and Bob McKellay, if we raise 50,000 during the festival, they will double it. Text double up to 44321 or go to milwaukeefilm.org slash donate to donate, or go to milwaukeefilm.org slash members to become a member and help us meet our goal. Milwaukee Film couldn't do what we do during the festival, as well as throughout the year without the support of our members. Members get access to free films throughout the year, discounts on tickets, passes, and more. Plus, our members keep the nonprofit Milwaukee Film going. If you think that sounds appealing, join us. If you're already a member, thank you and help us spread the word. To see our full slate of films and events, go to milwaukeefilm.org slash MFF. And remember, wherever you're watching this panel, drop your questions and comments in the chat or comment section, and we'll put them in our conversation. In addition to following Milwaukee Film, make sure you follow Black Lens on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now, let's get started. I introduce to you Malkia Stampley, our moderator for today's conversation. Hi, hey Tana, how are you? <laughs> Thank you so much. It is, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for thank you to Black Lens and Milwaukee Film Festival for having us tonight. Um, what what a great topic to talk about. I love Black women, and I think everyone should. And I love that um, what we're talking about um, is a conversation among some really powerful Black women that I cannot wait to start a conversation with. So. I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves tonight, um, tell a little bit about themselves, and then we'll get the conversation started. Let's start with you, Mama Fern. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for including me. I feel very honored to be a part of this particular conversation. Um, uh, I started off um, as a dancer, I am still a dancer in my mid 70s and I will be a dancer until I die um, and afterwards as an ancestor. Um, I taught at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee in the Department of Dance, Peck School of the Arts for 45 years. I'm now retired and um, I founded the Kofi Dance Company, which is now celebrating its 52nd year, which is in itself a feat in America for a company that does African dance and Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm also the mother of a 50-year-old, so you can tell what I was about doing in the last 50 years, <laughs> 50 uh, plus years. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward deeply to the conversation. I really enjoyed this film, and it has so much to talk about. We could talk definitely long past an hour on just the impact of this particular film. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Fern. Milena. Hello, everyone. My name is Milena Moore. I am a local Milwaukeean. I um, graduated from Marquette University uh, recently this past fall. I have a degree in theater arts and my minor is in social welfare and justice. I'm an actress and a playwright. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this film. I'm really excited to be in this room, first of all, being the youngest, I feel like I cannot touch what most of you are, you know, already doing with your lives. So I'm really blessed to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Ms. Ida Cola. Alapia. 
My name is Adekola Adedapo. I am a um, multicultural coordinator, program coordinator for Al Verno College. I've been there 10 years. I'm an activist. I'm a Yoruba priest. I'm a um, grandma, mama, entertainer, educator, and um, generally love my people. That's basically been my, my, my mantra all my life. And so grateful that I can be a part of and the generation that created a situation for Milena that we're millennium where she can be a senior and get published instead of, you know, competing so hard and and still losing because she's BIPOC. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm so, so grateful to be here. Um, I'm not even sure sometimes why I'm asked, but I know I'm a rabble rouser and I have relationship with all of these women in the film. They were every last one of them icons for me, except for Pamela Greer, because I knew I could never look like her. <laughs> she was too fine. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, um, you know, but I'm so appreciative of all of their examples and the history that they made and um, just grateful for the time that I came through. I'm um, um, in my 70s now and grateful to be alive. Thank you, Ms. Adekola. And our, our special guest for tonight, Ms. Yoruba, can you introduce yourself for us? Yes, hi everybody. Hi, it's hi. so great to be in conversation with you. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And I wanna thank Black Lens and the Milwaukee Film Festival for inviting me and they've had me before to screen one of my previous films, The Green Book, a couple of years ago. And we were luckily you know, able to do that in person. Um, but I'm so happy we are in conversation here tonight. And it's also wonderful to connect with people in different regions. I'm, I'm here in New York, um, New York City and in Brooklyn. And uh, it's, it's amazing you know, to be able to talk to and here, I'm excited to hear about your experiences, uh, where you are in Milwaukee in the Midwest, um, and you know how that also shapes our opportunities uh, as artists and, and activists, and what we're concerned with, and and what we're the kind of work that we're making. Um, so it's it's great to to be here. Thank you so much. Thank thank you to all of our panelists. Um, again, for taking your time out of your day to, to have this conversation. Um, so I'd like to, to talk to you, Ms. Yoruba, about, about your film. And first and foremost, um, your, your inspiration for telling this story, telling the story about who we know to be such iconic women as Ms. Adekola said, um, but to, to focus on these particular women and, and this topic, what, what was the inspiration? Well, I actually have to go back a little bit uh, in my life to, to talk about what the inspiration is, uh, what was for making this film and why I was immediately taken uh, when I read the read the book, um, and which it's which it's based on, but I grew up uh, here in New York. I grew up, um, and I think it has very much to do with our topic t today. Uh, my mom was a writer; she was a, a playwright, um, and uh, uh, her whole, um, you know, her whole the work that she that she did and the work that she put out there was about Black women and liberation and um, using art as a political tool. Art and activism were closely a lot, you know, were intertwined in her life. She was part of the Black Arts Movement. And so growing up with that experience, um, with the, you know, with my mom, really I think set the groundwork to do the kind of work that I do in general, in ge generally, but especially with this, with this film. Um, I uh, read about the book, it came out in 2014. And even before I read the book, I read a review of it. And <clears throat> I immediately thought it would make a really powerful film because we, um, it was, it looked at these six women, that six women, how uh, they change representation for black women on stage and screen 
and in their particular time period. Um, it also set the stage. Um, I saw these women as setting the stage for what we see today in terms of uh, Black women telling their stories and having the power uh, behind the camera, behind the stage to tell their stories and that these women set that up for, you know, for us, which are, you know, which we are now living in. And also looking at the evolution of the entertainment industry through Black women's eyes. We'd never seen that before. So those are the, those are the things that drew me to, uh, you know, to thinking that this could be a very powerful film. It was a take that we hadn't seen before. And, and just lastly, you know, oftentimes, there's a focus on the biography, the sort of birth, you know, born and and died here. And that that's, can be fine. But I often think you can miss the impact of, especially, you know, our, our icons. I think you can, you can miss the impact of and legacy of who these women, you know, who their, their significance because of our history we are, you know, are <clears throat> in the entertainment industry and in other industries, but in the entertainment industries, we build upon each other because we're each making, we're making strides in these, um, in these institutions and in these fields that, you know, are built on literally foundationally built on racism. So anytime mm -hmm. we make a stride and we actually have somebody who says in the film, anytime you see a black woman on screen, it's a political act because, you know, she, she says, <coughs> excuse me, I know how hard it was to get there. So I think biography can sometimes miss the, the impact. And lastly, <laughs> when especially when it's not told by us, and there has been a spate of films in recent years that are told by white filmmakers that um, focus on the tragedy of, you know, of an artist's life. And of course there's tragedy. I'm not saying that's not part of it, but that can often obscure, as I said, the larger cultural impact and innovators that we are as Black people and as Black women. Thank you so, so much. And I agree that, um, well, I, I certainly feel that your film was powerful, impactful, and, and it was something that I had not seen before. You do get bits and pieces of of people's biographies, but to see that inter that interconnection, um, I thought was was beautiful. And I I would say for me, I I wasn't very familiar with Abby Lincoln, and the sacrifices that she had to make. And yes, maybe with a different storyteller, it would have been more focused on the tragedy of of what she had to compromise. But I found I saw the power in her freedom, um, the power in the choices that she made and how she was free. And, and you don't see that. You don't see that freedom in, in every artist, um, at least from, from my perspective. So that, that's what made it very powerful. Thank you. Thank you for telling this, this story. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, so, so to be free becomes, you know, I think with each of the six women, it you know that that name kind of resonates that title resonates with each of you know the women and, and what they did yes yes and i i can't wait to talk about with the other panelists um that word freedom what is what is the cost of it is it attainable a, as an artist um so you you talked about building building on the legacy or or the the foundation that many have come before us have built for us like Hattie McDaniels um, and um, and all the women in, in the film and and it's easy to it's easy to sometimes look at our past and be ashamed of it or or feel that they could have done more um, but really they were opening up the doors for us um, but but with that, Considering the compromises that many of our, our ancestors have had to make in Hollywood, do you see that there are compromises still being made today with 
with current artists and especially considering the ones that you you've interviewed um, and and uh, and profiled in the film do you see those compromises still being made well I think that there are still institutional barriers that um, force compromises right like Halle Berry says in the film you know she said you'll be surprised even after I won the Oscar the roles that I was offered, you know, that I wasn't offered great roles, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, Lena Waithe talks about the fact that she gets, you know, and Lena is in a very powerful position, much more than, you know, Halle Berry was when she won her Oscar. But Lena talks about how she, you know, gets light-skinned women at, on the casting calls. That's the first round that she gets, you know, and then she has to sort of negotiate from there. So there's still institutional barriers, certainly, uh, that we face, but I think we also have to recognize, you know, that we're a hell of a lot further, obviously, <laughs> than when Lena Horn, you know, signed a contract saying that she wasn't gonna play maids and people in the jungle, and therefore she doesn't get any speaking roles because they don't know what to do with her, you know? So it's important, I think, to look at that trajectory. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, you know, on a, I'm often amazed at the sort of choices that I'm getting now as a viewer, especially on TV, you know, to watch my experience, different experiences of my people. Like that is new, that is super new. Um, hopefully that will continue and only grow, it's still only a small, you know, a small, a small in comparison, but it's really something. Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel that even over the last few years, you've seen, you've seen just this boom in content, almost as if there's, there's this hunger um, uh, for, for new content um, and, and what it is to really be black and different different angles of, of what what is black life um and it's as as a performer myself sometimes i think oh please don't let this be a fad please don't let this right. be a trend um yep. maybe move on to some you know somewhere else all right uh so fern Milena and Ida Cola and miss yerba th this question is is for all of you but um anyone please please chime in um thinking about thinking about these women and and their their struggles and their successes um i'm wondering and maybe this is more for our our older our older performers what compromises have you had to make in your careers to to be where you are or to to have what you have had or or the successes that you have had just wondering some of the some of what those compromises have looked like or or felt like if you could just give us give us some of that especially mama fern and miss ida cola having such a long um a long great career in the arts i'll let ida cola talk first <laughs> Oh, we can't hear you, Ms. Oh, oh dear. Uh -oh. oh, now we can. Now we, Go ahead. Now we can hear you. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, watch it, youngster. Talking about long. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm only, I'm only kidding. I love Malkia. Um, uh, I think one of the things I can speak to in terms of compromises is one of the reasons I'm not a national star. I have an international reputation for a lot of different things, good things, but um, as a, as a, what I wanted to be as an actress and as a performer and entertainer, I did. I mean, there were so many compromises as early as as high school when I would be passed over. I'd be ten times more talented than any of the white kids that were in the audition, but I would, um, you know, get passed over. Or I couldn't be in a romantic um role with the white boy in 1965 so you know i had to accept whatever role usually it was the other woman or it was the odd one out um all kinds of not not being in the center of the relationship of the the core characters and the family and all of that so um i refused to do maids and i stopped doing choruses and i went on into 
to education and went to school and college and you know tried to explore other things but there were so many times where even as a light-skinned woman race got in the way and then there um were the challenges in marriage of you know you should be here doing this well you know my destiny my career says i do this my angela single-handedly saved my destiny and that's a whole nother story um but <clears throat> um there just were there were too many things to try to devote myself to building a national career which is what it it takes big work and there seemed like a stopgap so finally i accepted that the way to do this was to do it in my world and be as good as i am in where i am and teach and pass my art and my talents to the children who might have a better economic base and less challenges in terms of busting through the ceiling of the national stardom, you know, because <clears throat> it, it's held before you like the golden nugget and it really isn't. What is the golden nugget is being a good artist in your midst and being a honest person and helping children and educating and giving people a helping hand and sharing your talents the, and, and building within your community uh, so that the, the entertainment arts, the cultural arts are preserved. And those are, that's the golden nugget. And that's why I feel very accomplished and very good because I know I'm holding it. And uh, in all the people and all the children that I help, that I teach, the young women that we sponsor in Alverno in our cultural ceremonies with rites of passage, um, lots of good work that can be done and yet and still my soul is entertainment and i i those women meant so much to me i can't explain each and every one of them meant so much in terms of helping me at a point in my career where i was in a quandary and i would say nope she did that so i could do that and the the thing i relate to most not most but surely is Lena Horne's statement that light-skinned sisters, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And boy, boy, oh boy, have I got stories to tell about that. But none of them are bitter. Mm. They're all because we sisters. Thank you, Miss Ida Cola. Mama Fern. Wow, so much Ida Cola is, is saying that I can relate to. Um, for me, um, I think of compromises, and I and I, I think maybe it's because I'm I'm writing now that I have very specific examples that I can reflect back on that I didn't have time when I was so busy doing it. Because I think back starting my career as a young dancer, um, and I wanted to be because that's what I saw in front of me was an Alvin Ailey dancer. So I was studying modern dance and was really good and went to NYU and got in, did the audition, and the ancestors had other plans for me, uh, unbeknownst to me. Um, but I had a couple of experiences that really kind of reshifted and moved my level of comprehension um, as to what this world really was going to be about in terms of a young black dancer, because um, I was in a ballet class, for example, and at the dance bar, um, this white uh, teacher told me to tuck in my behind, that it was too extended in the back. And I, I tucked it in and then I realized I couldn't free up my legs because I was tight, tightly squeezing my buttocks. And, I, and this was a physical demeaning process that he put me through because it, it shifted me totally um when i turned and snapped my neck around and i think i don't think it was even me i think it was an ancestor that snapped back at him and said my ass is already tucked this is my inheritance <laughs> is what i said and then i picked up my dance gear and stormed out of the room and see that that pushed that catapulted me but it also devastated me and i know that as i walked out i was feeling hum physically emotionally humiliated and I was crying inside, but I knew that I was lifted by something very, very deep. Um, I think about a music class that I went into as a young dancer and we were working on compositional work and the, um, uh, that we had to talk about what kind of music we were going to pick. And I had been blown away by Ravi Shankar 
um, of his the the, rock, the, the yeah, traditional Indian music, but mm -hmm. I was comparing that to Jimmy Smith's jazz organ music, and I was in between. I was in between both of those two forms, and I was I was so choreographically um, uh, uh, turned on by those two forms. So I mentioned Jimmy Smith, and this white professor looked at me and said, "Jimmy Smith, who is that?" and you know, my whole little world as a 19 year old, 20 year old was like, do I have to explain everything about black people? You know, is this what this means for me? And those experiences led me to Ghana, led me to working with the National Dance Company there and realizing that I didn't have to apologize for that um, and that I could make a way and that I realized standing at Elmina Castle and looking out over the Atlantic Ocean that I was not alone in this struggle. And mm. people, and it's the feeling of aloneness that gets you. It's the feeling for young people knowing, and that's why your film is so important because young people can look at that and realize that their struggles and what they're going through are not, they are not alone because the aloneness is what gets you. You think you're the only one going through this. Um, so I think about the sense of um, the compromises. I think I made a decision very much like my sister Adekola, where it was not about going to the Ailey company. I realized in Ghana that I needed to work with the, the, the art form that stimulated, that was ingrained in my soul as a young child born in Africa, uh, raised in the United States, that I was able to connect those two things. And that became the mission. And it's been, uh, I've been possessed by that mission. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what helped me overcome. So I think part of the, 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 the ability to overcome the, is that there have been no compromises for me in my life because I believe that everything has been destiny based. So I really don't feel I've had to compromise anything because er, even though I didn't understand where I had to go, when I was when I got there, I shook my head and I said, "Yep, that was destiny." <laughs> that was destiny. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Milena, just hearing hearing these stories, and I know that you are a recent graduate of Marquette University in theater. Um, just wondering, wonder take your take on all of this, and wondering who who inspires you um, as as an emerging artist in in theater and the arts the arts in general yeah i mean listening to all these stories i definitely feel parallels already with you know my coming into the industry and what that might mean um i definitely resonate a lot of those stories about whether or not you have to compromise and when you compromise uh, mama friend we talked about whether or not it actually feels like a compromise and like what you have to do to get there i feel like i'm inspired mostly like it literally is like a room like this um like people who look like me and like i feel like when we had our our discussion before you know we all kind of were able to really let loose and talk to each other and it's like those really raw and organic conversations that lead us to do the work that we're doing um to continue to power through um no matter what so yeah i just I think, you know, we've all been in those spaces where we've had to, and it was a part in the film that I love so much about, you're not just a black woman, you're, you're not just fighting for being black or being whatever gender or whatever class you are, like you're constantly fighting a battle for everyone. And I think that that's something that um, Mama Fern and Adekola have spoke about that really resonates with you know the type of art that i go for i always say like i write things and i do things for black people but it's not necessarily just for black people it is you know constantly the black woman has had to fight and be the voice for so many other movements and have led so many movements um and i just yeah i think it's amazing what we can do when we all come together and just on that that note, I think, you know, <clears throat> that these women, right, opened up the doors 
uh, for subsequent generations, but also open up the doors for other communities that are now fighting for their representation. Um, you know, communities that have been marginalized and ignored on screen. So I think that's, that's really important um, part of their, their history and their legacy. And then one thing I wanted to say, you know, when Adekola talked about the, uh, you know, being light skin and, and struggles within that, in the film we did, we also, I also sh tried to show um, certainly color, colors, colorism and issues around color were an issue. Um, and uh, how, you know, Lena Horne exactly was, you know, could not be with other black performers and, or could not, and could not be with white performers. They didn't know what to, to do with her. Um, she couldn't be sexy in that bathtub scene because she was too sexual. And they were, you know, they couldn't, that couldn't happen. And then also too, just the inter conflict, inter racial conflict that we've had. One of the things that I thought was really interesting and that I, I didn't know until I started making this film, but that there was backlash. Each of these women had backlash from, from their own community. So Lena Horne, right, when she signed that groundbreaking contract, she, um, she, you know, some of the, the folks who had been playing the maids and the servants and the, uh, uh, the maids and the servants were, you know, got angry at her because she, you know, if she refuses to play those roles, then, you know, they, are they gonna still make roles for us? Uh, mm -hmm. Was their, you know, their thought. Um, Julia, Diane Carroll got backlash from the black community about, um, uh, you know, her groundbreaking show, Julia. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, was it black enough? And was it, you know, realistic enough? Um, black exploitation. you know, we see Sicily giving, uh, real critiques of black black exploitation, um, and you know there was definitely a feeling among you know many in our community that those were just stereotypes. And mm -hmm. how could we be you know putting out these stereotypes when we had just you know been fighting the civil rights movement? So I think it is important to talk about how you know the backlash uh, can happen. It's not just from the outside, mm -hmm. but from in our own communities too. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh uh, was that me? Oh, you, you were responding. I thought that oh, yeah. You I, I was responding because it just gave me a flash. Um, I'm thinking about this backlash thing, is that that was one of the hardest things, I think, to overcome. And because that's the last thing you want is to have to feel that you have to fight your own people um, when you're trying to and to actually uncover that which they themselves do not even know yet or have experienced or have have had the opportunity. Um, I'm thinking about how when I was producing and choreographing shows at the Paps Theater and Alverno College stage and had done uh, if I stepped out of the quote traditional African dance motif and stepped out of doing choreography that was theme based. Like for example, I did a piece called The Hot and Tot Venus. And because I chose that subject matter, I had some black people in Milwaukee who were very offended with me because I put focus on this woman with this really excessive butt, which if they knew about the history of the hot and tot, and the hot and tot Venus, then they would have had a different sense. And I was trying to deliver that as a, a, a really important piece of work that was based on, on uh, uh, the book, Rebold book. Um, and there were, and at the same time, I caught it. It was really interesting. I caught negativity, not only from my own community, who sisters in particular who were offended by the lead character in my piece who we had built an actual extra butt on her butt so she would look like the hot and tot looked and i had white people who walked out of the audience who said they didn't come here for all of that they just came to see african dance a la safari dance mm. okay so that was one of those were the biggest hurdles that I had to go through as a choreographer that I it was I got penalized and got people got upset when I stepped out of the safari mode of what African dance is supposed to look like. 
Yeah, it, it makes me think about um, it. We we had in our uh, a previous conversation, um, we talked about how black women we are carrying so much for everyone, and it was even mentioned earlier tonight in how it's we we help open the doors for other communities, other groups of people, um, and men who all kinds of people we we carry so much on us and i i wonder in that carrying knowing the load that we are carrying who we have to represent um is it possible to lose your authenticity in that when you are so focused on what black people need what black people shouldn't be doing, what white people or the man are doing to us and how we have to rise above that and how we have to be held to a higher esteem, but yet nurture and support those who need help. We're, we're, we're supporting, we're nurturing, we're birthing life um, in so many ways. And, I, and so that compromise, sometimes I feel like there's a compromise of yourself to, to create art. I think because I see a trend, or I, not trend, I see so many just this need to include so many, to, to be so inclusive that we are willing to forget about ourselves and our story to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table. Ms. Adekola, yes. Authenticity. Oh, I'm, oh I'm, I'm muted now. Can you hear me now? Yes. In my mind, authenticity is almost always at risk because of the very factors of trying to please people. There is always going to be somebody that really pushes back and does not agree with the position that you've taken if you're in a position to do that and be um, influential in your community. Um, and, and I learned when I was in junior college, well, my first lesson was when I was 13, but it came home when I was a junior college and I was doing a lot of theater. Again, as I was saying, it was so hard because I had to really push to have to, to, to be authentic in a role. And um, I, they, they took a picture of me sitting between the white table and the black table in the, in the commons because I was studying and they were laughing and talking and gossiping and they just didn't interest me. So the white folks just hadn't and I wanted to hear. So I've studied, I was studying. And one of the students, um, the photographers for the student newspaper took a picture of me and published it on the front page of the college newspaper. And it said, the missing link. Okay. So. <laughs> wow. At first, <laughs> I've got the picture. And at, at, at first I felt terribly, terribly insulted. But as I have my, my way of staying authentic, okay. When I was seven years old, y'all called me a black nigga, and I looked at myself and I said, that's interesting, but okay, just remember, you called me that. Just remember that. <laughs> and so when people went through this thing with me about the missing link, I said, I am that. So you better listen to me because I can tell all y'all how to work with this because I've been working with this on my own by myself since I was 13 years old. So, you know, there's, there's lots to this, but authenticity is what I strive for. Authentic is from your heart, but it culturally, it has to be some kind of correct. And we, fortunately, we're so diverse in our own societies now that um, being inclusive is almost impossible because uh, black people have come a long way. We, we, we have extensive cultural experiences that aren't always central anymore. Um, and one way I kind of don't like that, but it gave us a place to relate when Fern and I were coming through as the young revolutionaries and the, the uh, old wizened revolutionaries that we are. <laughs> but um, so authenticity is the thing to strive for in my mind. And that cannot be compromised and be authentic. Mm -hmm. I believe in reparations. I, I have a quote. I have a quote that I think fits right in here by Zora Neale. And I'm so glad that I got hip to her when I was in college because mm. she became my spiritual guide. Zora Neale became my spiritual guide. And she writes in an essay how it feels to be colored me. Mm. And she wrote, sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it does not make me feel angry. 
It merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. And I read that when I was like 20 years old. And it has stayed with me forever because it's like, how could you not know that I'm brilliant? How could you not know that I'm talented? How could you not know that I'm articulate? When you talk to me, you can hear me structure sentences. How could you not know this? So I, my theory is that I think they do know, and that's precisely the problem. That's exactly. precisely the theory. Yeah. Yeah. They, exactly. They absolutely know. And that's exactly. what they, you know, my mom used to say, they don't want the competition. <laughs> you know? That's it. And that's, I think we see that in so many realms. But uh, just going back to, to your thing around authenticity, the, there's authenticity, and then there's another thing that worries me, is that because we feel like, you know, we have to, you know, take on all of, you know, all of the represent everybody, take on all the problems. And it's true when we, you know, we see it in entertainment, we see it in politics. When we are uh, at the head and we are making, uh, you know, we are fighting for justice, we're not doing it just for ourselves. We're doing it for everybody, right? We make the, we take care of everybody just by the nature. We don't, we're not just doing it for our, you know, for our own people or for just black women, everybody benefits. But mm -hmm. I do wonder sometimes if that burden um, that we can have in taking all that on, can, can, it can, it can, um, can, it can uh, what's the word, stifle you. It can make you uh, unable to create or you hear those voices in your head. And as an artist, that's that's a fact anyway, right? You hear that's the thing that can you know can we hear the criticism? We're putting ourselves out there, you know. You got to quell those voices in your head so you can do your art. And then we have the added voices of like who we're responsible for, what we're trying to say, how we're trying to you know represent not just black women but black men who are you know. And I feel like that can uh, there's a danger for that to. Um, stifle us as as artists. Um, I think you know you you look at women like Alice Walker, who talks about this and what it's needed to to be an artist. You know whether it's you know your own space or time away from your children if you have children or not to have children or you know to be able to be brave about those um, brave about those needs for yourself as an artist. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, even if you do, you know, I often get asked, like, is the work that we do automatically political or should it be or, you know, and I, for, for me, it is, my work is political, but I don't know if that's true for all black women. And I don't want them to have to have that burden to, I want, you know, I want people to be artists if that's what they want to be. So anyway, those are some of the things I yeah. think about when we think about those, those things. Absolutely. And I, it, it makes me think, um, you know, growing up with my, my parents, my parents were, well, especially my dad, very much um, black power. And um, he was a little bit more radical in his thinking than, than other black people. I guess I, I grew up around, um, there was, <clears throat> I felt this pull or this mandate to be, for everything to be all black. And in my career is definitely shifted in that way, but I had to check myself on looking at fellow black artists who wanted to be comedians and be on and be okay with being on a white sitcom Com uh, or, or people who, who wanted to do even a completely different genre that wasn't R and B. So <laughs> gospel, um, the, those, you know, those acceptable black art forms who wanted to do different things. And, and I, 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 I grappled with it because it was it, were they trying to go beyond race? Um, and I felt like it was this missed opportunity to open a door to, to, um, to show black life, to lift up black people. Um, but it is, it is bigger than that. And I do feel that some of it is generational as well, I can't expect my son or Milena, those who are in their 20s, 
to think the same way that I do or have the same mandate that I've put on myself to make sure that I'm including Black people in everything that I'm doing, that I'm okay with doing Black theater. I'm okay with that word Black. Um, and I find that I, I do find that with our younger, our younger people or, or d different people that sometimes even putting that in front of it to them is limiting. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely my, my take on that. Yeah. If you look at someone, I was just quickly, I was going to say, going back to Diane Carroll, right? Mm -hmm. She wanted to have, she wanted, she said, uh, we wanted to do a show, we wanted to be a comedy, we wanted to be about this nurse, we didn't want it to be about race. Um, and, you know, that's just what she, you know, wanted to try as, they wanted to try as a, as a sitcom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is something that we see kind of all mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. to our, our history. Yeah, and, and I, I think what I wanted to add here is that I feel that we have to strive always instead of the pronoun for me, she or her or it or them or you. <laughs> I like to put human, <laughs> just human, because we, we keep recategorizing ourselves over and over and over again. Because if we see ourselves as human beings, as citizens of the world, of which the African diaspora is the world, which I had to explain to one of my white colleagues many years ago, you know, that, um, that if that is the case, if Africa has informed the world in terms of art and mathematics and all of these things that we, that we learn about in history, then we are human beings. And from that stand, I think when I made that transition, that I was a human being who was black mm -hmm. and had as a result of that, a wide expansive legacy to take with me and to share into the world. And that my specificity was in working specifically with my own folks, with my, the babies, right? But that was a choice. But I'm a human being first who has that as a directive. And so I go back to Miles Davis, Love Supreme. It's all Love Supreme. And once we can all get to that point, then we don't have to talk about, well, we'll always have to talk about color and race, but we can then choose our specificities inside of being human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fern, okay. Yes. And is my mic open? Yes, it's there. Okay. Yes. I I uh I call it coming into my African mind. I mm -hmm. think that's what made me comfortable with some of my more controversial stands that I've taken because I've been for reparations from day one. Mm -hmm. Um I've all I, I feel like I've always been on the other side of the question. I'm light skinned in the black society. I and and I say black society because that's the one I'm concerned about. And um, and I'm, I was a, a female jazz artist in a male jazz world, and the male priests and the Yoruba, um, you know, granted certain things for the female priest. Uh, I don't let people call me a priestess because I'm a woman who's a priest. But I found my African mind in my 30s, and that's what made me make a decision about which direction I was going to go when I had a quandary for everything, but especially mm -hmm. entertainment. Um, because the donning of the African garb on stage was one way to show my people, hey, this is culture. And there's a lot of folks in the jazz and it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's not beating people over the head or trying to teach people. I just tried to be an example. And, um, I, but it was finding my African mind. And I go back to the authentic because I felt that if I stayed in that and I, the more I learned about culture and I've studied everything, I mean, I, working with Fern on any level, watching her company for any amount of time is a lesson all by itself. And I've been at it for years. But um, uh, just measuring my authenticity against other cultural icons of my generation, like Fern um, and Amani A and, and different folks that are in the... Uh, in the uh, Hollywood world, um, but it was finding my African mind that made me strong, that made me, that gave me balance because the world um, 
Africa gets the worst rap and, and of course, black women carry the globe on our back. And like Lena Horne said, that's, you know, to have to represent all the time is a lot of work. It's a lot of mm-hmm. responsibility, <laughs> but, yes. you know, so finding my African mind and that's what I think saved me in a lot of ways and also gave me, because those are the stories I want to tell as a storyteller. I want to tell the stories of the African gods and heroes because you can't find them anywhere in the Hollywood world or in the Disney world. And uh, as Fern pointed out so aptly some time ago, the only African heroes were animals. And, you know, we need African people to be personified. So I think that's kind of coming next. I think people are finding their own mind even in, in Hollywood and we are understanding the necessity of having the jobs behind the scenes so that we can continue to make movies and produce and produce and produce. And that's where we should be. That's what we should be really preparing our our children for is that aspect. And some of them are going to be stars. If you have any questions, this is to the the audience. Um, Please feel free to type it in the chat questions about the film, how does it feel to be free, or questions for our, our panelists. We would love to to know any questions that you have. We Looks do like have, we have a, a yes, yeah. yes, we have a question from Antoinette. Milena, what is liberation to you? What does liberation mean to you? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, and it, I, guess, I guess it goes back to what we were kind of just talking about um just me muddling over like listening to everyone speak um in the film it talked a lot about how and there was this one quote i forget who said it but like as soon as a black woman is on television or on film it's it's instantly politicized and i think what we've been speaking about and malkia you even said something about you know whether or not i need to can i just do art or do it does it have to have the word black in front of it and for me, I've I've been like a stickler on like, yeah, I write for black people. I want to write black stories so that we don't have to play the mamies and the mermaids and you know, all that. Um, but then it goes back, then I, I think again, um, Marcy Martin, who I love, she's like 16 and she's an actress and an executive producer and she's doing great things. She had a quote where, you know, she's starting to write her own things and she kind of said, you know. I don't want to have to write black trauma stories anymore. I want to just write. Like, I want to just write stories similar to Julia, where, you know, I can just exist in my life. I don't want to always be held to my oppression. Um, I think all of these women fought for us not to have to deal with that. And it it's kind of like, you know, in this day and age, we still are held up to telling black stories and telling everyone's story and carrying the burden on our back, I think it would be great for, you know, me to just exist as a human and be able to write a story and, or to be something, you know, if I wanna just go out and do this role. Um, it was really heartbreaking to hear, was it Lena Horne's story about how she was a light-skinned African-American woman, did makeup for her, yet she still didn't get this role that she was perfectly qualified yeah. for because she had yeah, all the songs and all these. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, yeah, it was just really heartbreaking to hear things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, being able to tell our stories and being able to tell them authentically and not being held to a certain trauma that I have mm-hmm. to tell. Um, Being a Black woman, of course, our story is very different and it needs to be told from our voices the way that we want them to be heard. But I think there's something so beautiful. I wrote down during the film, being Black is my biggest flex. It's It's my biggest flex? It's my biggest flex. Like, I love being Black. And it just, it hurts so much that we cannot just exist in the way that we are and, you know, the beautiful spirits that we have. So I think Black liberation definitely it's just being able to be me and not have to explain it all the time hmm. mm. that's beautiful it is I, and I, it's, I, 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 go ahead just gonna say it's it's beautiful it is beautiful and it's something that that i i definitely am still striving for it's it is the and that is my my wish for for those coming behind me the choice to 
to believe that you have the choice to know it and not have to always fight to have the choice to be yourself and to tell any story that you want. We need all of them. We need uh, uh, we need we need black people playing classical. We need black people playing um, mm -hmm. new age, doing folk, mm -hmm. um, all of it. Because we did have our hands in all of it, um, and yeah. so we we need we need it. And when we are skewed to one way of telling stories, or when we see Hollywood pushing money towards one type of story. You know, in the 90s, well, you higher learning and Boys in the Hood and um, Gen, uh, uh, Juice. Those movies were phenomenal. But then it was, it was so skewed that way that then that just, it became such a big stereotype. Or as an emerging artist, you felt like you had to tell that kind of story in order to be heard. Mm -hmm. So um, I, 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 I love, I love that. I love how you explained Black liberation, and I, I hope that, I hope that we all get there. Yeah. So I did, I did want to. I know that we'll be wrapping up soon. And please, if anyone has a question, please um, type it in the in the chat. But just wondering, talking about all of the pressures and the compromises and rebellion and liberation, um, the, the fight or the choice of liberation, just wondering how do you protect your sanity as an artist, as a storyteller, um, knowing the weight that you, that you can choose to carry, knowing that all the stories that you can tell, knowing that there's so many people who won't be heard and when you have the opportunity to be heard um, and the pressures of earning a living. We didn't talk about that, but navigating and balancing earning a living while while being rebellious. Um, all of that. We didn't get to talk about that. But wondering how do you how do you protect your authenticity? How do you protect yourself um, as an artist, especially considering the women who were featured in the document in, in the film who who some of some of them, like I, we think of Lena, Nina um, Nina Simone, and and the struggles that she had with her with her mental health and the deep dive that she took, how passionate she was for Black people and for civil rights, and at what point did it overtake her? Um, so just wondering, anyone have any thoughts on protecting your sanity as a Black female artist? Wow. <laughs> Right. I'll, I'll, go you... for, I'll go first on that one. Okay. <laughs> then I, I want to sit back and listen to everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the first thing I think is that is to get out of thinking that whatever it is that we're doing as black women, you know, feeding, taking care and feeding the white women's babies on the plantation, you know, nurturing their families, watching our husbands and our, and our, our children be taken away from us. Um, uh, playing the roles to just get seen. First of all, is understanding that it is not a burden. I think I think we have to almost remove the word burden from our vocabulary, because mm -hmm. we are now at a point in time where mm -hmm. I feel choices are going to be made by this new generation that's coming up. That it's really about gaining that that it's not selfish to self-love, that it's not selfish to self-care. And these are the things that some of our, our the women in the film didn't have access to around them to help them so that they could really talk through some of the anxieties and angst that they were going through. Um, and But now we have to be more careful about who we talk to, when we talk to, and I think the internet has opened up some things, but on other levels, I think it's really bad because it's kind of a fake kind of caring about one another rather than actually having mentors that, you know, that really help you lift that word of burden and being able to not be afraid to be selfish. No, I don't want to go hang with you. I need to read this book. If you read this book, you know, book clubs are important where people are starting to talk, read and talk and share. And the last thing I wanted to say about that is that I feel it protect the sanity. There has to be 
um, there has to be a, a, a place of meditation, a, a place of understanding the quality and spiritual feeding mm -hmm. of quietness and stillness. And that is what I feel is, is killing our, 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 our creativity sometimes and our young people is that they're rushing towards a goal and they've never sat under a tree and just contemplated. Just watch the ants all over the grass, you know, and see that struggle on that level and be able to really meditate. That to me is self-care, it's not selfish. And black women, last thing, have to learn how to say no. No is the magic word to release the burden. No is the magic word. Go on the internet. May I? I may I? Yes, yes, please, please. All right. No, I'm just asking for her if she's done. Yes, mm. I'm done. Okay. Go on the internet, whoever, and I can't remember the woman that wrote this, and find the poem, The Strong Black Woman is Dead. You must read that. <laughs> You must read that. It is one of the most brilliant, it is a brilliant uh, thing that's written. A strong black woman is dead. The other thing is that I love being a strong black woman, but every now and then I'd like to be called precious. And, <laughs> and <laughs> what you need is somebody like that, like that fern lady to, that, that you can call at two o'clock in the morning and you says, oh, I don't care. Do you need to talk? Yes. And vice versa. You know, it is a circle of friends, and it is, it is usually females. Your mama, your grandma, your auntie, your sister friend, your sister. It's, what, it's that circle that you can plug into. And I'm sure these women had someone like that. But the pioneers are always lonely. And that's the other piece you have to kind of accept as a pioneer. There's going to be some loneliness. But as Fern said, you can fill it with meditation and understand your connection to God because um, because there is a divine and because we come from the from the ancestral pool that that started all of this. So we it bad or good. We have to claim it all um, because we came from that. We we are never alone. We always have that connection. And one of the things that is is to have that strong ancestral connection because we were purposely disconnected from that because everybody else in the world understood how powerful it was is. So, first, I mean, you know, meditate, baby, and meditate on your root, on uh, where you come from, okay, um, and and find your your find find your your inner mind and and uh, hook up with Africa. Love it. Miss Yerba. You know, I don't really have anything to add. I just love listening to the wisdom. I think, uh, you know, my personal practice is I meditate when I, you know, when I, I don't do it all the time, but when I do it uh, and, you know, take the self care that I need, I believe in, you know, having space and time to be, to think and to read and to, say no and to not work so all those things mm -hmm. yes that's Malena. how you produce such a beautiful such beautiful films my lady thank <laughs> it's you. working thank you. it's working <laughs> thank you <laughs> melena um <clears throat> i think mm -hmm. the biggest thing is again like you said before being authentic to yourself um especially like when we're talking about nina simone you know and um ah oh, my head's blanking What's name? abby lincoln sorry mm -hmm. and just yeah. you know yes. no matter yes. no matter what is going on being authentic to who you are i know like i've been doing a lot of activism work and just like we've been talking about just what black women do and my mom anytime i go we'll go out the house or i go to a protest she's like ah i'm scared like you know don't don't say these things don't be this person or something like that. And I feel like what all of these women did in the film, you know, they had to stay true to themselves and true to what they were fighting for. I feel like that's the biggest way, you know, to keep your sanity. And I know we've been talking about um, the compromises that we've had to make and how they, you know, can drive you crazy. Um, but knowing that this work is what we're doing and 
um, what we're, you know, we're, we are speaking a truth of some sort. Um, and I think it would drive me crazy if I, you know, that's my biggest self care is like always, even when I went to school and they would tell me, you know, you need to step back, you need to be a little quieter, you can't necessarily say it like this. Like when I was writing white privilege, I would talk all types of stuff about Donald Trump and then I extended it and then I, you know, I had some things to say about Hillary. And this is during the election time and people telling me, you know, we're already bashing Donald Trump. Do we have to? Yes, we have to, because it's it's my truth. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, try to silence black women and, and all the things that they have to say because we have so many, you know, beautiful ideas and they're true. And yeah, so I think staying true to yourself and what you want to speak about, no matter what, is the biggest thing for me as a black woman and an artist. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank you so much for these pearls of wisdom. Um, I definitely took some notes because it was great for me and I, I know it was great for our audience. Please, everyone, check out How It Feels to Be Free, Yoruba Richin's, Richin's newest work with the Milwaukee Film Festival. Thank you, Black Lens, for hosting this. Thank you, Milwaukee Film Festival, for screening this film. You do not want to miss it. It is such a treat. I guarantee it will last with you for a long time. Thank you, Mama Fern. Thank you, Milena. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Have a great, great night.